How does this affect the military? We welcome our distinguished panelists and we are delighted to have Ms. Kathleen Troyer K.T. McFarland as our panel moderator. Ms. McFarland, K.T., is National Security Analyst for Fox News and host of FoxNews.com's DEFCON 3, one of the Internet's most watched national, national security programs. KT is a graduate of George Washington University with a master's from Oxford University and has completed the MIT PhD program. She additionally has had graduate fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Institute for the Study of World Politics, and the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Her years of federal service have included national security posts in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations to include aid to Dr. Henry Kissinger on the NSC, senior speechwriter to Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, and Principal Deputy Assistant Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. KT has also served as a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee staff. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. KT McFarland. Okay. I want to um, tell you, first of all, everybody on this panel is totally Dennis Clift and I and Secretary Lehman and Doug McGregor's son, who's a classmate. Here, raise your hands if you come out here. You got that, okay. I was just going to explain to you all the interconnectedness and LinkedIn factors. Um, Dennis Clift and I and Secretary Lehman all worked together as very young people on the Nixon National Security Council for Henry Kissinger. Uh, Doug McGregor's son and my daughter went to college together, and the gentleman who's a surprise guest over here got his college degree from Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, in 1983. Uh, if we had been here, <laughs> uh, and there's no chance that this gets reconsidered or taken back. <laughs> like, if we'd had this conference a year ago, when Congress passed sequestration, everybody would have claimed, look, sequestration is such an impossible poison pill that it would be laughable. It'll never happen. It'll force us into solving the debt problem. If we'd had this conference six months ago, well, the winds had started to change, and our senior civilian and military leadership said, well, these cuts would be catastrophic, devastating. So we are now hanging on the edge of the fiscal cliff. And it seems that those sequestration cuts may be a, just a down payment on even greater cuts in the out years. Old Washington hands will tell you, oh, don't worry about it. We've been through tough times before. It's just another of that cycle of boom and bust, defense spending that we've had since the beginning of the Republic. And you guys all know the drill. The war is over, whether it's World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, and now Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's time for that peace dividend. We always cut defense spending after wars, and even so, after unpopular wars. We focus our national attention back to domestic issues, jobs, taxes, infrastructure, health care, education. This list seems to always remain the same. But if we're in tough economic times, even our defense hawks morph into fiscal hawks. During the bus cycle years, we downsize the military. We cut end strength, stretch out procurement lines, slash R&D, and reduce readiness. The military and defense industry complain in war of dire consequences and increased vulnerabilities as we hollow out the force. But we manage to muddle through until the next crisis jumps up and takes us by surprise. And then we act quickly to ramp up our armed forces, pour money back into defense, deal with the new threat to the national security. The boom years are back. Look, it's not an ideal way to manage our nation's security, but it's a cycle we can't seem to escape. And so far, we have managed to make it through. But there's a growing sense that this time, things are different. Unless there is a last minute reprieve, the sequestration cuts will go into effect in three weeks. The new Congress and administration might, on top of that, pile on additional defense cuts as part of some grand bargain. There seems to be growing recognition that the cuts of this magnitude could be so catastrophic and wrenching that the same old boom and bust cycle no longer works. If so, we've got a choice to make. Is there a way to squeak through just one more time, 
Could we cut even more weapon systems, stop major shipbuilding programs, slash the number of contractors and consultants, hollow out the force, and maybe retire a few extra admirals and generals? Will this be enough to get us through the next few years until the economy improves? Or is it time now for option B? Back to basics. Rethink and prioritize our, our vital national interests and give up those heretofore sacrosanct missions. Or is there even an option C that we need to, to go back to basics and really redesign the whole system? These approaches have serious and perhaps irreversible consequences, but right now there are no good options left. If we take that first option and hollow out the force, as we've always done in the past, it comes at a price. Secretary Lehman and I uh, saw this firsthand in the Reagan administration. We came into the Pentagon in the early 1980s, and we saw what a decade of neglect had wrought. We had ships that couldn't sail because they didn't have the fuel. We had planes that couldn't fly because the pilots hadn't logged enough flight hours to be qualified. And for every tank we had on the ground, we had one sitting right next to it, which was cannibalized for spare parts. But worst of all was what we had done to the men and women in our armed forces. We were paying our active, our junior active duty enlisted so little that they qualified for food stamps. Rather than being proud to wear the uniform, our military personnel routinely wore civilian clothes to their Pentagon jobs. Our Vietnam vets had seen their benefits and services cut, and I will never forget the sight of President Reagan speaking at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier on Memorial Day and paying tribute to our Vietnam vets. That was the first time a president had done so. There were homeless men in wheelchairs with medals pinned to their chests and tears in their eyes. These were the men our system had abandoned. But perhaps the most telling symbol of America's weakened defense posture of that era was the 1979 failed rescue mission for American hostages held, uh, held hostage in Iran. There were helicopters stranded in the desert which never made it to Tehran. Well, despite how we had hollowed out our military by the late 1970s, by the late 1980s, we reversed course. Thanks to Secretary Lehman, we had rebuilt our Navy, we rebuilt the defenses, and we were in a position to win the Cold War without firing a shot. So that's what happens and can happen with a turnaround. But there are also risks right now if we don't cut back on defense spending. As former JCS Chairman Admiral Mullen said, the greatest threat to our national security is a weak economy. If the economy collapses, everything else is collateral damage. There won't be money for defense or intelligence, robust or otherwise. So defense cuts are coming. And there's also a mood in the country, if not in Washington, that those defense cuts are warranted. That for the last 10 years have been good times for defense, and it's time for them to give something back. We fought two wars, expanded the armed forces and intelligence communities, and hired thousands of consultants and contractors. The attitude in the country right now is it's time for defense to take its fair share of cuts. So if we do cut, and the cuts are so massive that we can't hope to carry out our traditional miss missions, much less the new ones of cyber and drone wars, is this the first time that we really need to consider eliminating entire missions? The Cold War is over, people would say. The Soviet Union is no more. Russia is a superpower on the wane. Do we really need a large land force in Europe? China is a superpower on the rise, but it'll be at least a decade before it presents a serious challenge to our interests in the Pacific. Do we really need such a large and expensive fleet to patrol the seven seas, some would argue? And then finally, bin Laden's dead. The war in Iraq is over. We're withdrawing from Afghanistan. Former Secretary of State Gates said we'd be crazy to fight another ground war in the Middle East. So isn't there a peace dividend in there somewhere? But if you go down that route, then you have to start saying what missions are no longer necessary. And if we do add new missions, like cyber, are others just expendable, like Europe? Finally, when you consider these issues, I think there are two elephants in the room. Personnel. Personnel costs, that's benefits and medical bills and legacy costs, eat up an ever larger percentage of the defense dollar every year. Are there savings to be had in personnel? Or do we risk in doing that? Do we risk doing the same thing that we've promised ourselves we will never do again and try to balance the budget on the backs of our wounded warriors and returning vets? But the second elephant in the room is the procurement system. With the buildup of the last 10 years, and really the last 30 years, 
has the procurement system gotten so complicated and out of hand that we now have paralysis through analysis? Well, to try to walk us through all these issues and come up with some new ways of thinking about it, the Naval Institute has brought together three great strategic thinkers who I suspect approach this topic from three very different directions. I won't go over the many titles and awards each of them has earned over the years. You've got that in the biographies and your handouts. But I will introduce the three gentlemen with me. Um, as you, some of you may have come to, to um, listen to Congressman um, Randy Forbes. Well, he's actually been called back to Congress for three mandatory votes to keep us from falling off that physical cliff. So in his place, we have a man, um, Dino Avalos, and he is a former Naval officer, as I said, uh, a graduate of the Naval Academy, getting his degree from Secretary Lehman. <laughs> Sorry? So just barely. Began. Just barely graduated from the Naval Academy, but he is still here to talk about it. And you know, a degree is a degree, no matter if you were first or anchorman. Um, <laughs> So we won't ask you if you actually got your degree handed to you, for, because that's only the first hundred, right? Oh. Well, anyway, this poor man is now the Vice President for Acquisition, Budget, and Logistics for Washington Operations for Lockheed Martin. I can't imagine three more complicated jobs right now than Acquisition, Budget, and Logistics. You are, you've got a big X on your back from just about everybody who wants to cut defense. Well, the man who gave this guy his degree in 1983 is John Lehman. Secretary Lehman was President Reagan's legendary Secretary of the Navy. He was the architect of the 600-ship Navy of the 1980s. Those were the glory days. He was known as the man who brought ships in on time and under budget, something which is just sounds, I mean, we can't even conceive of that today. So for the last 30 years, Secretary Lehman has had a successful business in private equity, investing in companies that actually build things. But he's also been an outspoken critic of the huge amount of bloat in the defense and intelligence communities with a bureaucracy that has doubled in size since he was Secretary of the Navy. And finally, we have Colonel Doug McGregor. He's a retired Army colonel, best-selling author, decorated combat veteran, defense analyst, and the man Ron Paul said he would tap for Secretary of Defense in a Paul administration. Colonel McGregor has written provocative articles with titles like A Radical Plan for Cutting Defense and has called for reducing America's commitments overseas. And as I said, you may be wondering what an Army colonel is doing at a Naval Institute conference. Well, a little secret. The college his son and my daughter went to and graduated from, not as anchormen, I might point out, was the, the United States Naval Academy. So I want to know about the McGregor family. Which side are you guys going to sit on this Saturday? Oh, well, the McGregors dodged the bullet, and they just don't show. <laughs> anyway, we're going to start this. And the way we're going to structure this is I'm going to grill these guys for questions for about 20 minutes or so. And then I, unfortunately, have to leave to attend to a family emergency. And so Admiral Daly is going to open this floor up to questions from the gentleman. Um, since I started by saying we really have, what do you think we ought to do? Uh, let's make sure the mics are live. It's on. I've learned that the hard way. Just start talking, and they'll make noise if you, they can't hear uh, you. In the first place, I, need, I just need to clarify, I'm a, as, as was noted, I'm a poor substitute for Congressman Forbes here today. Uh, but I'm not here in my capacity as a defense industry uh, uh, employee. Uh, and, and more to the point, uh, I have a modest amount of experience in uh, programming and budgeting, first at the Office of Management and Budget, and then on the Armed Service Committee and the House of Representatives. I also served as the uh, Comptroller for the Department of the Navy uh, from 2001 to 2004, and then I was the Undersecretary of the Navy from 2004 to 2006. And so I'm really here to speak in the capacity of a former uh, defense official that has some, uh, perhaps some uh, impressions about how some of these uh, fiscal challenges that we're all likely to face over the next few years uh, might be reacted to uh, by those institutions as opposed to uh, expressing concerns about specific programs or, or where this might go. Right. So if I could just caveat it that way, that'll, uh, that'll ensure. So you won't you to anything you said. My, ensure my continued <laughs> employment, so that's, that's important <laughs> to me right now. So, but I, and to, to come to the point on your question, uh, as we sort of approach the fiscal cliff issue, I think the most pressing challenge for the department is the issue of sequestration. 
as, as we go into this period of defense drawdown, I think if you go back and look at the record, Secretary Gates will tell you that he took about $300 billion out of the defense top line over a 10-year period for, on his last budget. As the Budget Control Act of 2011 established another discretionary reduction to the defense top line by about another half a trillion dollars. So simple math, that's about $800 billion out over a 10 or 11 year period. If we actually implement sequestration, uh, you'll be looking at another roughly half a trillion dollars out of the defense top line over that same 10 year time span. I, I respectfully suggest that cuts of that magnitude would require a dramatic rethinking of the national security strategy of the United States. And so this isn't just something that you can initiate and then have the comptrollers go out and find up some sweep up money to sort of figure out a way to reapply this. This is going to be major surgery at that point. And I think uh, it, it, if it's, you're going to have a balanced program on the back end of that, it's got to touch everything. It's got to touch personnel readiness investment accounts. And so the question is how that would be dealt with. And so, so do you think we have to go about cutting missions? Or is there some other way to do these phenomenal changes? I think if you were looking at cuts of that magnitude, a revision of the national security strategy would certainly look at, uh, at, uh, at sort of load shedding the capacity, a lot of that engagement work, also humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, disaster relief, those sorts mm -hmm. of things. There's sort of lesser included capabilities that, are, that exist within the force, but it's just not something that you will certainly budget for within a baseline. I think you will see a contraction. Uh, and the size of the general purpose forces, uh, so you will have a limited, a more limited capability to respond uh, should you have a, a force that's that much smaller. Okay, so a lot of that is still what people could call frills. You're not talking about, let's give up the Middle East or no, but, but let's I get out of Europe. The CENTCOM commander may not be able to uh, receive the same amount of forces from the, the, the entities that generate forces. You may have to have a much a, a smaller presence, mm -hmm. or you know, you may not be able to maintain two aircraft carrier presence uh, in the CENTCOM AOR for per, project, for protracted periods of time if the aircraft carrier force structure were to be smaller. For instance, I'm just using that as an example. Okay, so I think I would, if I had to say which option you're going to take, you could say we would be still be able to hollow out massively, hollow out the force, but not start giving up what we have considered here to for vital national security missions? Again, I'm not a representative of... No, no, I understand. But yeah. the, I believe that any rational national security policy would look at a balanced capability within the force. You wouldn't preserve modernization at the expense of readiness or preserve personnel at the expense of modern... You know, mm -hmm. you would try to make it... to size the force that it's sustainable and balanced and capable. If it's going to be a smaller force, you want it to be a capable force. Okay, let's now switch um, to Colonel McGregor. You have... Set. Uh, we're not going to go one, two, three and prepare you. I'm going to jump around. So, <laughs> Colonel McGregor, you have talked about cutting missions. Do you want to, so you're going to now come and defend or talk to us about what might happen if we cut missions and if so, which ones and how? Well, thank you for calling on me. I yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> By the way, I was so glad that you mentioned that my son graduated from the Naval Academy. Uh, I went to VMI in West Point. I graduated from the Military Academy in uh, 76, and never did I think I ever went to college. I completely missed that experience. <laughs> so, uh, now that you told me... Well, you know, that, that we can actually get into a really great conversation about West Point versus Annapolis, but we will save that, because I have a feeling in looking at the audience, you're going to lose that one. Well, I, I just find it disturbing that the American people are putting people through college. Anyhow. Uh, let, me, let me set forth, in response to your uh, question, a uh, couple of general propositions. First of all, in an earlier session, a gentleman stood up and made some comments about the debt. Uh, I think debt matters. I think if John Maynard Keynes were resurrected and shown the $16 trillion debt, he would rapidly retreat to the grave. Uh, we are in for a very difficult period. Sequestration is the tip of the iceberg, in my judgment. And this is the first, I suspect, over the next couple of years of several fiscal cliffs. So I think that the downward pressure on defense spending is going to be unrelenting. That's the first thing. As a result of that, uh, we need to adopt a general proposition. And this, this may come as a shock since I graduated from West Point, but we need to understand that we Americans and English-speaking people are of necessity a global aerospace and maritime power for reasons of commerce and connectivity. We are not a global land power, nor do we want to be. That is territorial imperialism, and as we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is a disaster. It's an economic loser, and it's ultimately self-defeating. In that connection, I would like to drive a stake 
through the heart of Madeleine Albright's ideology, which says that we need to be everywhere doing everything all the time, particularly in backward societies with dysfunctional cultures. We need to stop. It's not only unnecessary, it's counterproductive. So with that in mind, three suggestions. The first thing we need to do is recognize we've got a lot of redundant overhead. We have too many regional unified commands designed to cover the globe. We don't need to do it. We can reduce those commands. We need to go after the multitude of single service headquarters inside those regional unified commands and begin the process of finally standing up permanent joint force commands designed to command and control whatever we send to them. In that connection, we need to start looking at our forces through a different lens. We need to look at it from the standpoint of ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, strike, maneuver, and sustainment. We need to look at those capabilities in the forces. How do we package our forces with those capabilities to maximize them? How do we integrate them across service lines? Because we are not going to continually buy new stuff. What we need to do desperately is integrate across service lines the capabilities that we've already got. That's going to take a long time. Doing these things isn't easy. It's a 10-year proposition, but we need to get started. And then finally, don't expect the services to do any of it. Alfred Thayer Mahan, who, by the way, was born at West Point, <laughs> said no service can or should be expected to reform itself. That was his advice to Teddy Roosevelt as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He was right. None of the things I'm describing will be done by the services. It will have to be done to them. Well, and how would you to carry on? How would you propose to do that? Well, I think we're going to. Congress does that, or? Well, I think Congress and the White House are going to have to sit down over the next year, and they're going to have to have some very serious discussions about the capabilities we want to pay for and keep on active duty and employ. And we're going to have to dramatically scale back the expectations that we have of missions. I mean, right now we have people all over the all over the world doing all sorts of things, and quite frankly, most of what they do, in my judgment, is not necessary. I mean, I give you lots of anecdotal evidence for that. I mean, I sat with a, a Navy EOD officer who's been in the Horn of Africa several times to train people, and he said, well, you go there, you train them, and then you come back in three, four months, nobody knows anything, the equipment doesn't work. So we go through the whole process again and again and again. I think this business of building partner capacity sounds great. In reality, I think it's very limited. And I think we need to also step back from all of the institutions we've become accustomed to. In case anybody hasn't noticed, the world is changing. Bretton Woods is going to come to an end. NATO is, in my judgment, dead man walking and has been for a long time. We are going to move into a world where we have limited liability partnerships, where we cooperate with people for limited purposes for limited periods of time. But this rigid framework, good versus bad, good versus evil, black and white, enemy and friend, is gone. And it's likely to be gone for quite some time. And remember, the debt bubble that we're struggling with is not unique to us. It affects China. It affects everybody. So the, the notion that we are facing in the near term, and I would say near term within the next 10 years, a significant existential military threat is wrong. But that, that does not mean that we should not work now and build the military capability along the lines that I've argued over the next 10 years, because in 10 years, the world will have changed again and we will look at a new set of actors. Okay, well, I think we got one on one. One guy who says we can probably hollow out the force, it'll be really, really, really hollow it out, and another guy who says, let's give up missions. Is there a third way, Secretary Lehman? And by the way, I want to add that Secretary Lehman, when I was sec the Secretary of Defense's speechwriter, and Secretary Lehman was the Secretary of the Navy, he had a nasty little way of always inserting 600 ship Navy in every speech that we sent to President Reagan. And he knew once he got President Reagan to say 600 ship Navy, he had him. The problem was, Lehman had to build the ships. KT, I'm happy to cede the rest of my time to you if you want to continue. <laughs> 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 Uh, first, I, I'd, I'd really like to thank Pete for, uh, uh, for decorating the, the uh, front rows here with all these beautiful brown shoes, leather shoes, and uh, leather jackets. Uh, it's very comforting to me, and uh, thank you. I have become a, a cliff diver. Uh, I think we ought to have, we ought to let 
let the government drive right over that cliff. And the reason is because I think our system for providing the common defense is so broken that it will take a major crisis to, uh, to be the catalyst for getting some real, real change. And uh, I'm not at all a fatalist to say, well, it's just, you know, it's, uh, bureaucracy is permanent. It, uh, uh, it will, uh, you can't really do much about it. I, when I moved to New York after I fled Washington, the, uh, uh, the common wisdom up there was New York was such a mess, it can never be fixed. It's so endemic. And then Giuliani came in, and we're in a golden age in, in New York. And the same thing can happen to our defense establishment. It just needs, I think, a crisis, and it needs, uh, it needs some leadership. And uh, uh, the, the system doesn't work today. Uh, you've all seen it proceed since the Reagan era. We have a Navy that's less than half the size, an Air Force that's less than half the size with aircraft double the age in the, the Reagan administration. You have an army that's half the size, and you have a civilian bureaucracy of 970,000 people uh, that is more than double the size it was when we had twice the size of the force, and we're producing ships and jets under budget, not over budget. So. We've reached a, a, a point of entropy where it, the system just doesn't work, and we are unilaterally disarming. And if we continue without a major, major change of course, uh, you are going to see worse overruns. You're going to see uh, worse cuts uh, without rational planning, and we will become a, a a, a very second tier uh, influence in the world. I think it's happening, it's happening before our eyes. When you see that uh, the, uh, the system for, uh, uh, for running programs where there is no more line authority, there are currently 40 uh, joint requirements entities that have the power to write change orders where the Navy's LCS program averaged 75 engineering change orders a week, a week, because every entity in the Pentagon had the right to have an input on the on what should be or shouldn't be on the ship. Why, you know, uh, the cost was doubled just by a joint uh, requirements committee demanding that it it top speed not be 41 knots, but 45 knots. So they had to change the whole propulsion system. That's just one of many, many items. Nobody's in charge. Nobody's held accountable because everybody's in charge. There are so many entities. Uh, and there are many causes to this. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over the last 25 years or so who have never heard a shot fired in anger, redesigning new staffs that can do new joint training and new joint requirements. And all of it is additive, unlike in the business world where you have to renew, you have to be a work in progress, you have to be uh, reducing constantly, uh, finding ways to improve productivity and reduce overhead. Doesn't happen in, in government. So without a, uh, without a real crisis, I think, or at least a major paradigm shifting uh, uh, event. Uh, it's not going to change. It's going to continue to deteriorate. As you know, uh, the current budget uh, it will reduce uh, active duty personnel by 80,000 and increase civilian personnel by a net 20,000. Hello? Uh, this is not rationality and everybody knows it. So to say, oh, we just, you know, we have to get, we have to avoid uh, these uh, mindless cuts that are going to take place when the Pentagon has to take a $40 billion cut uh, uh, is just really rearranging, worrying about having, having deck chairs taken off the Titanic. I mean, it has, it's irrelevant in the, in the scope of the crisis that we're facing. And 
I don't think this is this is pie in the sky. Uh, I think we happen to have, uh, and I hate to say this as a Republican, but we have more good people in the Pentagon management that get it than we've had in a very long time. And I, I think many of them are seized of the issue. They understand it. They understand that having 250 JTFs uh, when we used to have seven, uh, having a, a joint staff that's over 6,000 people when it used to be 1,700, and on and on and on, is, is just paralyzing us and disarming us. So uh, I'm for cliff diving. So, in other words, let me just, um, just cliff diving so that the whole thing collapses and we have to start all over again and, and rebuild? It's not going to collapse. I mean, the, the Pentagon's a pretty strong building, and the, the, um, the, the uh, system will continue to go. Uh, the payroll will continue to function. There'll have to be a lot of contract rewriting and a lot of uh, very frustrating things. But uh, don't forget, with a new Congress in, uh, there will be the ability to make patches uh, where where it really is becoming uh, catastrophic on a mini scale to let a cut as a result of sequestration in a specific area mm -hmm. uh, go through. But there will be irrationality and pain and uh, and hardship, no doubt about it. But on the scale of the budget today. Uh, the cuts even with sequestration and as disproportionate as they are uh, with regard in comparison to the rest of the government budget, it's not catastrophic and it could be the catalyst for a fundamental uh, rebasing of the way we, we do business. We are spending almost 50 percent more today in constant dollars adjusted for inflation than we did in the in the Reagan administration with twice the size force and uh, half the size bureau. So, you know, it's, it, what needs to be done, you can argue there are many permutations of what could be done mm -hmm. and achieved, and it is achievable, uh, but the, 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 the fundamental outline of the, the, uh, of the course change that's necessary it, it should be clear to everyone. I think that's a really good point to say. We all know we want to get there, and we're here. We just don't know how to get from here to there. And so, Dino, let me ask you, you've seen all sides of it. You've seen procurement. You've been on the industry side. Do we get to there any, with anything less than a catastrophic crisis? Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Oh, no, we can share. This is actually how we do cut back on funding. We only have three mics for four people. <laughs> First off, uh, if, if I may, uh, I, I want to disagree, hopefully without being disagreeable, with a, a statement that you... Uh, I have four children. I'm so used to this. You, uh, uh, <laughs> I was not advocating for hollowing out the force. What describing is in a constrained, a much more severely constrained environment that you might see post-sequestration, it would require a rewrite of the national security strategy because I do believe that a, a responsible administration would want to have a balanced force, not a hollow force. So they would not, they would have to look at cuts across the board in, in all the major areas of readiness, uh, you know, operations and maintenance funding. Obviously a smaller force would require less O&M money. Uh, smaller mm -hmm. force structure, smaller personnel, those sorts of things. So uh, not to preserve one element at the expense of the others was my point, but to take that down and then realize, okay, with this resource box that you have to live in, how do you provide for the, 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 the legitimate national security requirements for the country or what falls off the table because you just don't have enough to go around to do the, 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 you know, uh, the, the lesser uh, prioritized missions. So I, 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 I I understand the Secretary's point with respect to sort of this crisis sort of being the forcing function to try and in institute some major structural changes. Uh, I would say that if sequestration were to happen, uh, uh, to his point, it would not be the end of the world, certainly not immediately. The way the mechanics of the process work uh, is that con uh, items that are on contract right now would not be affected or that are on contract on 2 January would not be affected. And that it would really sort of take, at least in the initial phases, I believe, sort of the form of sort of a s slow rolling government shutdown. I mean, there's some interesting elements of sequestration that, uh, that are, are, are not well understood. For instance, while the military personnel accounts are exempted, mm -hmm. the President went and had made that declaration during the summertime, uh, the, uh, the finance offices are not. So if you are trying to execute a PCS move or any of the things that get funded through MILPERS, you may find your life disrupted because the people that show up to do that 
are either going to be furloughed for part of the year or they're going to have less resources to do their day-to-day -day jobs. That would apply to contracting activities. That would apply to, so even if you're, uh, your program is on contract and executing, you know, you're going to, there are going to be fewer people on the government side that are showing up for work every day, and they're going to be uh, remarkably uh, unhappy, and so that will have implications for folks' lives as well. Uh, the mechanics of it are such, at least uh, Secretary Hale, the Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller, uh, has stated that he believes, and it's pretty universally accepted, that he will have flexibility in the operations and maintenance accounts as to how to apply those reductions below the appropriation level. So for instance, Operation and Maintenance Navy, it's a huge account, funds most of the day-to-day -day operations and activities of the forces. He would, the, the Navy would be able to figure out where to park the, the, that roughly 9.5% reduction, which areas would not have to be a spread across the board. The acquisition accounts, procurement R&D, are a little less well-structured, although Secretary Hale believes because of sort of a, a unique thing that's going on because we're operating under continual resolution that he would not have to do the across the board level reductions at each number. Now that's not a that's not a, a, a mutually agreed position, but I think as th that he would again have flexibility as to pick which programs would suffer greater reductions than others, uh, and uh, that's not a settled matter, I guess yet even within the administration is my understanding. But I would project that if you get on the precipice of executing sequestration that who's ever in charge is going to want to claim that maximum flexibility in terms of how to operate under mm -hmm. that environment. So, because I think across program project activity, that just mindless 9.4% cuts uh, makes it remarkably difficult to operate the department. But to the Secretary's point, I think uh, if, if we do find ourselves in that circumstance, they will truck along. It may be the forcing function that you need for the major structural changes uh, that, he, that he has, he has uh, addressed the need for. But I don't think that it would be just a, a you know, a, uh, a precipitous crisis overnight. It'll take a while to develop. Uh, I tell people, and sometimes I use colorful language, so please don't be offended by this, that, uh, you know, ha going through sequestration or going off the fiscal cliff and then fixing it after the fact uh, is, is rather like a, being shot in the leg. And shooting <laughs> yourself in the leg and treating the wound afterwards is not exactly the same thing as not shooting yourself in the leg. And so I think ideally, uh, rational actors would try to avoid that that uh, that circumstance, whether it's sequestration or the fiscal click. But whether or not they'll be able to, I think. Is the yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just. Uh, and and by the way, jump in. Maybe it's because uh, Secretary Lehman and I are both from Philadelphia, but I agree with him. Uh, <laughs> I I don't think you're going to see any fundamental change without a crisis, and you're going to get your crisis. Uh, as I said before, it doesn't matter. Uh, whether we go off this particular cliff, the ravine is deep, and there will be many opportunities in the near future. Now, having said that, here's something that's very important. Uh, how many of you lived through the drawdown of the 1990s? Oh, good. Well, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Uh, just returned from the Gulf in 1991 uh, with the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and we suddenly received word that the entire organization, all 4,000, was being liquidated. Uh, when most of the junior officers and uh, soldiers, sergeants, and captains looked around, all of whom had seen action, uh, had performed brilliantly, extremely well trained, most said, well, that's it, and uh, began making plans to get out. And then subsequently, large numbers were told, absolutely, get out. I then found out, not long after that, that that decision was made to keep the 4,000 spaces in the 7th Army headquarters that supported the four-star. That is what will happen, does not make a decision. They will do that. Today, we have 11 four-star admirals in the Navy. The Navy is what, 400,000? During World War II, when we had 4.2 million men in the Navy, we had four four-star admirals. When we had 15 million men in the United States Army and Army Air Corps, 15 million, we had four four-star generals. Today, for the Army and the Air Force combined, we have 23. The Marine Corps, 487,000 Marines, was run throughout the war by a three-star. Today, we have five Marine Corps four-stars. Listen, we are approaching, in bureaucratic overhead, Banana Republic dimensions. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And I have sat across from four stars. I said, well, Doug, you don't understand. Well, I need that, uh, that four stars. I, you know, I command this. And, uh, you know, when I talk to other nations, uh, uh, you know, I'm talking to their chiefs of staff. So I said, look, for God's sakes, let's get real about the world we live in. You're worried about the chief of staff of the whatever it is, Air Force in some remote area. One carrier battle group of the United States Navy 
in the Pacific could overpower 90% of the navies, probably their ground forces too. If, if a, in my judgment, if a Marine captain steps ashore and speaks to the United States, they ought to listen. I, I'm tired of this rank inflation business. It's got to stop. We've got to go after these things because the kind of bureaucratic overhead that the Secretary spoke about is tied to the force structure. And if you want to retain the capability, I want maximum fighting power. I want to retain people who deploy and fight and capabilities that are committed to that purpose. I'm not interested in the nice to do stuff. I've already said that. But I absolutely don't want the redundant and unnecessary overhead that costs us a lot of money. And by the way, when you start talking about all these modernization programs, the Secretary's dead on target. These, there is no requirement stability because we have too many senior officers and civilians involved in this business. I mean, look, the Navy has a problem with ships. I, I sat with someone in the shipbuilding industry and said, well, don't worry about the Navy. We'll build ships whether or not the Navy can come up with a design that makes sense. That's wrong. We're building M1A1 tanks. We have thousands of those things. You know, large numbers of those should probably grow coral reefs off somebody's coast somewhere at some point. This is crazy. We, we've got to move forward. And I'm telling you, unfortunately, the service chiefs can't do it. They've got to have leadership, and that is exactly what the Secretary is talking about. Well, I want to just say, speaking of leadership, I think it's really amazing that a guy who, Ron Paul said he was tapped as his Secretary of Defense, and a guy who was on the short list of candidate Governor Romney's choice as Secretary of Defense, both agree with each other. That's really something to contemplate. Now, I'm going to have to nip out, and while I do that, I'm going to turn this seat over to Admiral Pete Daly. But I want you to raise your hands. How many of you think that we are going to go over the fiscal cliff and implement sequestration? And how many of you think that there'll be an 11th hour reprieve? That's Washington for you. <laughs> they have more faith than I do. Thank you all very much for the opportunity. Okay, I think it's a, a good point in the panel discussion to uh, open it up to questions from the floor. And uh, so I'd like to, we have a couple of mics, and please use the mic so we can hear you. And if you raise your hand, we'll get your mic. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King, federal employee. I'll direct this question to Colonel McGregor. Um, you had it mentioned uh, that you don't like a land occupation of foreign countries. Uh, but in, in the Navy, there's a certain baseline, I think, in terms of, of um, maritime choke points and sea lines of communication. For example, there's the Suez Canal, the Strait of Babel Mandeb, and the um, Strait of Hormuz, and so forth. And there's the Arab Spring, and there's unrest in those areas. And when we had the um, 1977 deals in the Panama Canal, uh, I think one of the conditions was that, well, if there were unrest there and, and some, something that threatened the canal, well, then we could send the military in. It'd be like the MAGTAF, you know, Marine Air Ground Task Force. But don't you think we should, uh, in certain strategic areas of the world, have certain minimal forces uh, in place uh, to, to prevent uh, the fact that we have a disruption of, uh, of co sea commerce as a result of something? Well, first of all, I don't think we should have very many forces on foreign soil that are ground troops. I, I think that's a mistake. I think they're catalysts for conflict uh, as opposed to st stabilizing forces, frankly. Most, most of the people uh, in, in most of the world that you're talking about are not terribly excited about having permanent army or marine forces on their doorsteps. That doesn't mean we can't provide forces that could rapidly move into those areas and secure what's necessary. But, but let's not exaggerate this thing. There are 82 million Egyptians. The 82 million Egyptians right now produce a gross national product that is a fraction of what 8 million Swiss produce. <coughs> In other words, it's not going to be very difficult to seize and control the Suez Canal if that's what you've got to do. Now, what kind of force should you send in to do it if it becomes necessary? That's a different issue. You also have other emergencies that might emerge that, that very few people talk about these days. Uh, what if at some point in the next two, three years, the Turks decide that the oil fields in northern Iraq really should belong to them and decide to occupy the area? What do you do at that point, if anything? 
I mean, these are, these are other questions. I'm not advocating the wholesale elimination of anything. On the contrary, I'm saying we're, we're not going to be able to maintain six or 700,000 men in the ground force. That's just impractical. It's unnecessary. And I, I also like the Eisenhower formulation. Eisenhower's view was operations should be short, sharp, decisive, and rare. Let's, let's not involve ourselves in things of great duration. And if we have to do something about the, the Suez or any of these areas, it should be of short duration. The notion that we can replace the government, install a puppet, and change the society is insane. We shouldn't get into that business. Don't want to do it. Ultimately, here's the good news. Most of the world wants desperately to do business with us. And we should want to do business with them. Other questions? In the middle here. Yes, hi, Kirk Jenny, Navy civilian. Uh, I have a question for you. Recently, Senator Coburn put out a report saying that the Department of, of Defense has turned into the Department of Everything. And he proposed about $68 billion worth of cuts. Though I don't agree with all of it, do you, I'd like the panel to respond to the question. Do you believe that we need a purification of our mission? And perhaps how we would do that? How about Secretary Lehman take that first? And there's also the prospect that comes up a lot about medical and other things that Congress lards into the defense budget as well. Yeah, I have, I, you're never going to get rid of pork barrel. It's been from the very uh, first uh, contracts for the six uh, super frigates. Uh, instead of building them where they should have been built in Philadelphia, they were spread around to six different places. That's inherent in our our system. So you you, you got to got to be realistic about what the real uh, the real issues that you can uh, deal with are. But uh, mission I is important. I don't think we should go back to a Key West as something as, as uh, deep as that. But this is a presidential role to set the strategy. Every, every president uh, has uh, what they used to, we called uh, NISM-1 in the, Reagan ad in the uh, Nixon administration. It was NSDD. Uh, three or whatever I forget in the Reagan years it was uh, um, uh, it, it was the ground basis for the guidance given to the other national uh, security uh, agencies and so that that is a given so certainly we need to re rebase our thinking and, and on what roles we ought to be in the business of providing and and uh, and so forth. But what I see more likely to happen when sequestration comes, or even if it doesn't with the cuts that are already foreseen, is the typical uh, think tank game. They're already slathering over it and uh, underway. They all, they all are designing their new armed forces. We could do with uh, half the number of carriers. We need more uh, uh, divisions of, uh, of this and fewer of this kind of, uh, 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 of airplane and let's cancel this. And let it's, it's just really, uh, again, playing with, uh, with things that are irrelevant to what our uh, real issues are. And unfortunately, the likelihood is that that's what will uh, will devolve. It'll be a mishmash unless we get the leadership to really take advantage of uh, of the crisis, as uh, as the president's uh, uh, White House <coughs> advisor said. Uh, it'd be a shame to waste it. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Avalos if he saw any obvious things that uh, you know, from your perspective, did you see structural things that were built into defense? that it's now time to examine, you know, I, I brought up one, which is, you know, biggest repository for AIDS research and certain medical research, it just keeps getting larded in. What, what can we do, or do you have any ideas on that? Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, associate myself with Secretary Lehman's comments with respect to whether you want to call it pork or congressional ads, what have you. Uh, it is a, uh, something of a fact of life. I do think that the Congress has policed itself somewhat more uh, than it has in years past, largely uh, because they felt like they were being held accountable by the American electorate. And it's much more difficult environment, I think, to get those sort of uh, things done than maybe it was uh, as recently as a few years ago. But, but having said that, I would say 
there's a lot that's different now about how you operate the department, even as recently as, you know, I've been gone for six years now, but even as recently as six, seven, eight years ago, with respect to costs. And uh, Secretary Lehman had addressed the issue of, of uh, in terms of actual inflation-adjusted dollars, how much he had to work with back in his tenure during the 1980s versus today, talked about the growth in overhead and bureaucracy. A lot of the cost components that go into fielding today's force are radically different than they were as recently as, as 20 years ago. Uh, all of us served as junior officers at one point in our career here at the, this table. Uh, the compensation structure then was radically different than what it is today. We have a, a, people use the term volunteer force, I'd like to use the term, we have a recruited professional force. Uh, they are compensated. Uh, the old contract used to be a below average wage while you're on active duty for a much uh, above average retirement for a, at, a, at a relatively young age going to taking you into uh, well into your uh, advanced years. Now we have a competitive wage and in some cases an above average wage while you're on active duty and a very generous retirement system along with a very generous health care system. I'm not arguing that that should be changed. I don't know what the right mix is in terms of compensation and benefits are to attract and retain the kind of force that we need going forward. But we have to acknowledge that we have a professional force and there's a cost associated with it. So again, to Secretary Lehman's point, in the private sector, you are constantly about how to, to figure out how to operate entities more efficiently and more effectively. And frequently that means how to operate them with less people. And so the question remains, if you're going to have that recruited professional force with all the cost elements associated with, not the least of which is a defense health program that is larger than the annual shipbuilding budget by a factor of three, uh, at least, I believe, and, and, and I haven't looked at that in the last couple of years, but. If you're going to have that cost element associated with people, then just accept that you've got to do things differently. You've got to have different management structures, management leadership structures, and you've got to look at how much you're going to invest in an acquisition system structure. I'm not saying what the right model is. I, I will say that somebody made the point that you just keep adding process to, or on process. I, I used to be an engineer, not a very good one, uh, but you know, one of the things I do remember from engineering is you don't increase the reliability of a system by adding to its complexity. And it strikes me that that's what we've done in many of these organizations over the years, because uh, it is easier to just sort of bolt something on than to try and make a fundamental change. Uh, I, I worked for uh, Secretary England back during his early tenure in the department, and we made some uh, aggressive uh, attempts to change some, some of the, the elements within the leader, uh, leadership and structures within the department. Not wildly popular, particularly in a time of increasing budgets. Some of that is now coming home to roost. As you see budgets come under pressure, I think people that have to be accountable for results are, are looking at these, you know, brushing off some of these old ideas and taking a hard look at uh, whether or not there's, there's room to be made. Because I do believe, even if we avoid sequestration, this is just round one. There's going to be an immutable pressure to further reduce defense spending over the, next, uh, over the next several years. And it's a question of whether it's $50 billion a year or $10 billion. I don't know the answer. I just know that the pressure will be there. And so. Thank you. Colonel McGregor, do you have a point on that? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm an a, a enormous fan of uh, Senator Coburn. I think he's a very fine man, and I think he's trying to make a point uh, whether or not the individual lines are accurate. He's frustrated with what he sees as uh, misguided spending habits. Uh, Admiral Harvey, before he retired, uh, wrote some very interesting things on acquisition and how he thought things should be done. And uh, I was doing some work at the time the Secretary Winter was Secretary of the Navy, and one of the things that I discovered when I talked to people in the fleet was that we asked for a shotgun. Two years later, they came back with a laser pistol, and it didn't work very well. Uh, this is an enormous problem that cuts across all of the services. Uh, this monster monstrosity was one of the reasons that I ended up leaving. There were many reasons I left when I did, but... Uh, this future combat system thing that uh, General Shinseki embarked upon. And I made myself very unpopular by saying that, uh, you know, you can't break the laws of physics. This doesn't make any sense. Well, it didn't make any sense, but we spent $20 billion trying to realize it. And uh, as Secretary Lemon points out, there was no accountability. None. Uh, we got to get out of the business of pursuing unobtainium. We got to work with what works now. Preferably as close to being off the shelf as it can get. So we can rapidly prototype something that we think has a chance of working. That'll reduce a lot of costs across all of the services. Yeah, there, uh, I'm in total agreement with my former uh, Army <laughs> colleague here. I uh, hope nobody took any pictures of that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I, I disagree on the point that the problem is the services. 
the, the services really are the last refuge of line accountability because that's the chain of command and <clears throat> and it's a culture particularly in in the Navy uh, because of its origins you know where uh, John Paul Jones was away from uh, Washington for three years at a time and so there is a, 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 a tradition of accountability that is different than the other services who, who are much more uh, part of the uh, Clausewitz uh, religious persuasion uh, that grew out of the general staff matrixes that, uh, that uh, were developed in Europe at the end of the 19th century. So uh, there, is the t there are the tools to work with in the services. The migration of fat has been from the services to uh, to the the vast uh, cloud of of OSD of the 23 independent agencies that have report to nobody of the 250 JTFs of the the uh, the uh, I think the smallest <coughs> of the COCOMs has over 4,000 people on the staffs. That's where it's gone. It has not, the services have actually shrunk. Uh, I was shocked to find that uh, we no longer have the Secretary of the Navy's uh, analysis staff in OPM. It's gone. Yeah. Okay. Like snow on the water, it's all gone up to the cloud. There are, uh, from some analyses, over 25,000 people distributed through DLA and through um, the uh, uh, various offices of OSD that are in charge of shipbuilding. You know, there were a thousand of them, a thousand people in, in Bew ships in World War II when they were building a, a thousand ships a year. So uh, the, the, the real problem is not in the services. It, 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 they, services can do nothing in acquisition without it going through uh, DOD 5000, which is, as everybody knows, a nightmare. I mean, it's an av it, the average time from initiation to fielding in uh, programs, the ACAT 1 and 2 programs that are in DOD 5000 is 22 years now. That's the average. And uh, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's not impossible. I think I have to give this administration uh, a lot of credit for the way they've used the uh, uh, urgent requirements systems to do things in a sensible, accountable, non-bureaucratic way totally outside the DOD 5000 system. The average time from initial message for a requirement from one of the COCOMs for a system to the fielding in that COCOM uh, of the first system is 401 days. That's what can be done. 22 years is what is being done. Okay, other questions? Um, down front here. Uh, Dr. London. Thank you. Jack London with CACI. If you look around the globe uh, and uh, watch television and look at the uh, uh, newspapers uh, above the fold, you see a dangerous world. You see a lot of things going on out there that are very unattractive and ugly. And uh, in my business, I monitor trend lines, and I don't see very many uh, positive trend lines. I see a lot of negative things happening. And yet in the dialogue, uh, and maybe I'm missing something here, but I don't see much uh, discussion about national security strategy. What are we putting all this together to respond to, to protect our nation? The United States Constitution uh, sets forth the primary um, goal of this government is national security. And we fuss about budgets. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Help me out. Where is the uh, national strategy, national security dialogue uh, taking place that uh, will drive or bear upon what we're trying to do with these budget issues? Thank you. Colonel McGregor. Uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to point out that this man, John Paul Jones, was the Hugh Hefner of the United States Navy. So I, I have a feeling that when he was gone for three years at a time, there was a lot more happening. And I think Washington and others were always very suspicious as a result. So, <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we have no one like that today in uniform right now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> for, 
first of all, there, there is no national security strategy, and we've had no strategy really since 1989. NSC 68 was the last document that stipulated what the armed forces would do in response to this defined threat. And it's a good document. If you go through it and read it, it tells everybody what they have to do. Lines of communication, uh, land, sea, air, everything. We haven't got it because nobody on the Hill really wants it, because everybody has an agenda. And those agendas are not necessarily aligned with any larger national purpose. Yes, if you watch the television, whether it's the BBC or Fox or anybody else, you're going to see lots of frightening pictures. But people don't seem to understand that most of it doesn't matter very much to the people in the United States. And they also don't understand that these peoples that we're watching tear themselves to pieces, their societies and so forth, are not a threat to us, but they are a serious threat to themselves. And they are going to struggle in these societies, especially this Arab Spring that is very rapidly transformed into an Arab winter. That's going to go on for a long time. Their problems are not fixable by us. And the last thing we need to do is intervene in it. But we also need to understand that we have an enormous reserve of military power to utterly destroy or annihilate anyone who presents a serious threat. But uh, once again, there's no requirement nor need, and we absolutely should not do so, and that is go into these countries and stay there. And I think this is why we're now where we are. We're looking at a reset coming, but we're not going to get strategic guidance of the kind that Secretary Lehman wants to give up front. And we need it. It's not going to happen right away. We're going to have to go through that fiscal crisis first, and then, then we will do what uh, Admiral Mullen said. We'll begin to make some hard choices. Okay, other questions on the end here? I'll, uh, I'll ask the same question I did the previous panel and we'll grade the, uh, the response, if I could. <laughs> um, that's the joke, actually. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I didn't laugh. In the private sector, we're very concerned about how a company is funded. Uh, the the uh, way we're funded has changed overnight, and I'm wondering if that can't uh, in other words, we're not funded by, by tax revenue any longer, although we do, uh, what you spend is what you tax ultimately, but we're borrowing. There's an additional uh, component there in terms of national security risk. Admiral Mullins pointed it out, and I welcome, welcome his leadership in that regard. How can that be translated down so that four stars who have uh, their, their, their heart in the right place, they're looking towards the security of the United States, understand that it's a different ball game today, that for, for the, uh, the, every dollar that we, we uh, uh, borrow adds to the national security risk that's associated with the debt. You don't have to look any further back than the, the security uh, Suez Canal crisis of 57, when uh, Eisenhower called up Anthony Eden, when they were 200% of the debt to GDP ratio, said, get your troops out. They saluted and got out. Th this is a real issue. And I think there's some people that are alert to it. And, and Admiral Mullins is one of them. Uh, and he's, he's beginning to move forward. But how do we penetrate that down so that people make the right decisions on their own? Because we'll, we, do, we, we do need to hold the, the services accountable. They do need to be led. But it's only going to happen from the bottom up. We know that. They, they have to lead from themselves and see the threat that uh, is out there if they don't take action. Thank you. Well, I think that's a difficult question because the bottom-up constraint idea, it runs against um, some of the other uh, things that we hold people accountable for. But, uh, you know, I'll put that to the panel, but I think it's a difficult question because I don't see constraint necessarily starting at the bottom. I think that it's really a question of ways, means, and ends, and you have to look at it, and you have to set that framework. But I'll, I'll ask the panel um, if they've got an idea on this, uh, Secretary Lehman. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that to the problem we're talking about here is not a shortage of good potential leaders of tough-minded, smart people. It is one that is on the contrary, the many, many of these really talented, dedicated, energetic people are embedded in amber 
uh, in a bureaucracy where they're constantly frustrated, where they know what the right thing to do is, they know how nonsensical it is to, to uh, uh, change a requirement for the speed of a ship from 41 to 45 knots when it's going to double the price, but they can't do it because they have to go through the system, the reviews, you have to have 11 boxes of initials to, to move any message forward. And uh, the, when you see things happen, they are, ha they are really successful things like we, we saw uh, in some of the urgent requirements programs. It's done by people willing to risk the hotline calls and the inevitable pushback of the vast bureaucracy against decisive action and willing to risk their careers by doing the right thing, the smart thing, and getting results, even if it ends up costing them their next promotion because they're not team players. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the promotion systems uh, in both civil service and in uh, in the uniform services are uh, increasingly risk averse. Uh, someone who may have been right but uh, broke the rules is, uh, well, yes, uh, she's a very talented person, but you know she's a bit of a disruptive influence. And uh, and that's what rules in promotions today. You know, there's a famous uh, uh, famous fit rep uh, of uh, Patton when he was denied promotion to one star, and uh, it was in 1939, because the fit, fit rep said, uh, uh, Colonel Patton is a very talented uh, uh, officer and would be invaluable in warfare, but he is a disruptive influence to the peacetime army. And that rules today, unfortunately. The, the message is out in all the services, unfortunately, and too many precincts that the way to make a star, and certainly four stars, is don't make waves. Don't precipitate a hotline call uh, over any matter, because just the call itself and the launch of an IG investigation, no matter how uh, unjust and ungrounded, is the end of your career. And so it raises to the top uh, people who are who get the game and are willing to play it. And they're not the people that are real uh, war winners and parameter changers, unfortunately. OK, I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's get somebody we haven't gotten before, um, this gentleman in the middle here. Thanks for your comments. Um, Tom Dickinson, Department of Defense. I'd like to get your thoughts and comments about reforming the DOD budget system. And I'm talking about the POM PPBS system, which as all of you know, is 50 years old, was established by SecDef McNamara and the Whiz Kids back in the early 60s. And I ask this because of my experience as an Air Force budget person for five or six years, uh, working the POM PPBS. And I was a program element monitor. And I remember the first year, I went into the three-star programmers. And you know I had my FIDEP list of budget requirements and gave it to them and gave my justification. And all went well. The next year, I asked my boss. I said, so what do I do? He says, well, go see the OSD budget analysts. Ask them. So I did. They said, just put 10% above everything that you did last year. Just add 10%. And like Secretary Lehman, like you were saying, the people that got promoted and that got the bonuses and things like that were the ones that every year added 10% to their budget without any real justification. You know, they go to the programmers and say, absolutely have to have this, we don't get it. You know, if it doesn't happen, the world's gonna end, that kind of thing. And then at the end of the fiscal year, come middle of, excuse me, the middle of August or so, that's when funds have to be obligated. And there was huge pressure to obligate on you know, unexpended funds, even though there was no real need for it. So what's, what's your thoughts about reforming the, the budget system at the DOD? I'm going to give the former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, FM and C, the first crack at that. 
First off, uh, we can economize by using one microphone. Uh, thank you. I think part of the, I mean, you touched on part of the problem in that it's a system that's uh, it's now uh, been entrenched for 50-ish years. Uh, there have been a number of different attempts over the years to try and uh, reform it or revise it or make it more uh, effective. Uh, I think a lot of it, though, is that people have grown up comfortable with it, whether it's the OSD staff, whether it's the, the professional staffs on Capitol Hill with the committees of jurisdiction in terms of how things are presented and justified and documented in, in this process that you go through that's understandable and knowable and somewhat predictable to all the players. So if you're going to do sort of a massive rewrite of that, it, it's going to take, uh, I think, a, a, an, an agreement, if you will, or the consent of all the stakeholders in that process. And I think trying to put that consensus together is rather difficult. One of the things that I noticed in my time uh, in, in Washington is that it's a rare chief of service that comes up through the ranks of the programmers or budgeters. I mean, let's be frank, they're the unpopular kids in, in any military organization. You know, Secretary Hale has a comment, I don't know if anyone has had the opportunity to hear him speak lately, but he says, you know, for, in the world of the comptrollers, they have a motto, and the, their motto is, we're not happy till you're not happy. And I think in that, and there's some truth to that, and that it's really about disappointment management. To your point, yes, you do get into some inefficient, uh, inefficient uh, uh, you know, resource allocation when you get to the end of a fiscal year and you're about to, the funds are about to expire. But um, this is sort of segueing a little bit back to the other, other question here. Until you've got a system that respects uh, attempts to try and drive management efficiency into the larger structure, whether it's the Department of the Navy or the Department of Defense at large, because, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a stakeholder, whether it's within a particular Air Force command or all of the Air Force, to be efficient if the reward for being efficient is to see your good efforts go to advantage somebody else's organization that is not similarly committed. And I think that is the challenge, is how do you motivate that good behavior with, a, with an understanding that there's an ability to reapply some of that. Part of the problem is uh, a lack of flexibility in the way that funds are allocated and the ability to reprogram, those sorts of things. Those are structural challenges that until the departments can show better stewardship of the resources, I would respect the Congress is not going to be sympathetic to giving them more flexibility. And so I think there's, it's a, but it's going to take a long-term commitment and long-term responsible behavior, I think, to drive that. I do think that the fiscal challenges that they're likely to be facing over the next several years uh, can create at least an opportunity to have some, some enlightened discussion about maybe better ways to proceed. But, but I think you've just got this big, uh, you know, morass. If you think DOD 5000 is complicated, you know, to, you know, just look at the financial management regulations. And so, and, uh, so uh, that's, I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but uh, it's my perspective. So. Well, I think that covers it. Well, Doug, you had a comment. One, one on quick comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Winston Churchill in 1945 said, uh, I was not elected prime minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. The British Empire was then subsequently liquidated because they were broke. And go back to Secretary Lehman's earlier comment, when there is no more money and you're not swimming in cash, all of these issues will be addressed, including national military strategy. Well, I'd like to thank our uh, panelists, and let's, uh, let's give them a hand. Dennis Clips is going to come. I extend uh, my thanks. Uh, and we have, for each panel member, a gift of the Naval Institute Press book, mm -hmm. In the Shadow of Greatness, which is written by members of the class of 2002 the 9-11 class at the Naval Academy on their experiences over the past 10 plus years.